On this episode, we answer audience questions, including the difference between all weather and all season tires, how wheel size affects ride and handling, and do you really need to change your oil every year, even if you don't put that many miles on your car? Next on Talking Cars. Hi everybody, welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm Jake Fisher. And I'm Ryan Pulzikowski. So every week we get a lot of questions from you guys and gals at TalkingCars at iCloud.com and we love answering those questions, but we get so many in, we don't get to as many as we'd like. So today, backed by popular demand, it's an all questions episode. Uh, so uh, also, for those of you that send in the video questions, pro tip, horizontal looks a little better than vertical. So that's just a, a little, little pro tip for you. But let's dive right into these questions because we got a lot we want to try and get through today for the good people out there, okay? So the first question is from Liam and says, uh, I have a question about checking the oil in my 2015 Honda Accord. I've always checked it first thing in the morning because I knew none of it was up in the engine. But when I did this after my last oil change, it didn't show that the oil level was full. The dealer says that's incorrect and says I should check it about 10 minutes after I shut the car off. When is the best time to check my oil? Now, we're very fortunate here that we have uh, John Ibbotson. Uh, he's our shop supervisor. Mm -hmm. He takes care of all of our test cars. Mm -hmm. He says that actually either one is correct. You, you know, uh, he prefers checking it first thing in the morning when the car is cold. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, uh, you can also check it after the car's been running as long as it's been sitting for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how the bad reading happened, except unless, what I wasn't clear is maybe Lee changed the oil himself and then checked it too soon before the oil had drained, drained down. That's the only thing I can think of as why to get the bad reading. Because otherwise, either one of these is correct. And of course, right. another, if, you know, we're talking about pro tips, uh, make sure you check your, your oil when the car is on a level surface. So. Yep. Well, and also make sure you get it all off. You know, make sure you get a off rag. Because yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, one of the common things people do is they mm -hmm. pull it up and you're seeing oil level is high, but it's actually just hitting right. the side of that little Yeah, you little should clean tube. it. You, you know, when you pull it out that first time, clean it off and then go back in and then back out because you, that first reading could be oil still splashed from whatever. Or, exactly. Uh, you know, yeah. um, it's better to get that second. Absolutely. Even I do it a few times just to really be sure, you know. Yeah. Sometimes hundreds of times. Yes. <laughs> all day long. Don't even have it's to drive It's a critical anywhere. thing, all right? He's got some issues. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. <clears throat> Jinsu says, why aren't all weather tires more popular? I've seen a few tests out there where all weather tires are compared to winter tires. But how do they stack up to all season tires? Is the lack of popularity due to a lack of testing data, marketing, consumer awareness, or performance? And of course, uh, those longtime viewers out there know that Ryan is one of our tire experts. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ryan, I'm gonna throw this to you. Talk right. to us about all weather tires. All right, so for those who don't know, all weather tires are basically, um, think of them as an all, all season tire with more winter traction. Um, now he's seen them compared with winter tires because they both have win uh, mountain snowflake uh, simple on the sidewall, which means they both pass a certain level of tr um, snow traction to have the symbol on the sidewall. Right. So um, all weather tires are still a compromise. There's one tire out there, the Michelin Cross Climate Plus, which we tested, which is a freak of nature tire, does everything really well. <laughs> like head and shoulders above the other yes. all weather tires? Yeah. Um, there, it just does everything well, very well. Um, but that's just odd, kind of an odd oddball. But in, in general, all, all weather tires are still a compromise. Um, if you know a, a, a dedicated snow tire has really really good snow traction right a all-weather tire has really good snow traction but not quite as good as a dedicated winter tire it's gonna be better than an all-season tire though so you gotta think of it as there it's slotted between an all-season and a um, dedicated winter tire now there's still still a small uh, growing category here in the US these tires were invented years ago by kind of by accident by Nokian tire right. um, in Europe they have summer tires and winter dedicated winter tires and they wanted to design what would have been their all season tire, but they put a lot of emphasis on the snow tire side. Now it comes to the, you know, years later it comes to the US and we already have all season tires all right. and we have dedicated winter tires. So where does that go? It goes in between the two of them, like I said. Um, it's a small group of tires, it's growing slowly. Um, it's also, in the US, it's very regional. Right. Not everyone gets snow, so it's not gonna well, be- I mean, um, I, I just wanna kinda go into that terminology because like, you know, all seasons, that's every season, all weather, all weather, they so, seem like the same. So, so that's another thing. And the other thing yep. is we talk about winter tires and we talk about snow tires. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, kinda, right. you know, there's terminology, snow and winter tires, right. same thing. 
uh, question. Makes it more confusing. Also, since, we're, since, we're, <laughs> right. since we're asking you questions. Yeah. So is the all-weather tire designed to be driven year-round like an all-season tire is? Yes. You know, because we know the snow winter yeah, I'm tire sorry. is I, not. I left so. that out. Yeah. So because it has the mountain snowflake, it, it, it allows you in certain areas where it's regulated that you have to have a snow tire on. Like yeah. certain areas in Canada, um, you have to have a snow tire on. So the mountain snowflake lets you do that, but also well, you can drive it year-round. So it has right. a, a higher speed rating, and um, so it can handle the heat buildup in the summer, this, that, and the other thing. It's great for people who don't want to switch from winter tires right. to all season tires or summer tires. It actually sounds like, like it would be a really good tire for where we live in Connecticut, where we get, you know, we usually get a few snowstorms right. a, year, a year, but we're not getting tons of snow, like say up in, you know, right. in, in Vermont or Maine or stuff like that, right. where, where you probably want the better traction from right. the snow tire. But like I said, it's still a compromise on the all season side. So right. uh, wet and dry traction isn't quite as high as say a regular all season tire. <clears throat> or a summer tire. I mean, that's or a really the, summer tire. the so, best of the yeah. most worlds. Yeah. Yeah. In an ideal world, you run a summer tire and then you run you switch a, over to a, a, a dedicated winter right. tire. But right. I, I understand people don't want it. It's, yeah. it's more it's money like, it's, it's you know, more effort. We wear boots in the winter when there's snow. Oh, right. and we were, you know, yep. flip flops. Well, summer, exactly. Yeah. Regardless, <laughs> it's it's a growing segment, right? Yeah, and, it is. Uh, it's, we're gonna it's see still, more and it's still more fairly offerings. new. I yeah. think that's the the, the real yeah. answer to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's another question. This question is from Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany says, "Sadly, our 2008 Volvo C30 needs to be replaced. We put a lot of miles on our cars and appreciate dependability, comfort, and the fun factor. We'd like something newer that can, can accommodate our dog, preteen, and long commutes into Seattle." My unicorn vehicle is dependable, <laughs> fuel efficient, all wheel drive, has a manual transmission, <laughs> heated seats, and it's fun to drive. Tiffany wants everything. Right. Uh, oh, and under 35,000. Oh, really? What am I looking for? Does this exist? Jake, you're the smartest guy here. No offense, Ryan. Um, <laughs> oh, none taken. I'm not doing tire what questions. What is Tiffany's unicorn vehicle? Because this is a difficult one. It's a difficult one because- It doesn't exist. Well, it, <laughs> it, 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 it may. I mean, the problem is, is that Manual transmissions, sadly, are kind of going away slowly. Right. And also, when you start packaging all-wheel drive, there's a lot of vehicles that are available that there's a manual transmission, but you only get that with the two-wheel drive exactly. one. You can't get it with the all-wheel drive. Or, or base, or, and you doesn't have the uh, heated seats or whatever. Exactly. Right. So, so my recommendation for this would be the Volkswagen Golf All-Track. I think that's the right vehicle. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing is you don't want a unicorn vehicle, all manual right. and all. You also want a wagon too, because yeah. you want it. You right, know, I was going to say. Be more unicorny. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I think that's a word. Um, it is you're, now. You're the word guy, so <laughs> you've, okay, you've okay, okayed it. So um, yeah, the Volkswagen Golf All Track, which I mean, they keep on changing the name of what this offering is. It was the, the, the Jetta Sport Wagon, the Golf Sport right, Wagon. Right. Basically, it's a Volkswagen Golf Station Wagon, right. um, all wheel drive, manual transmission, you can get it with all the safety. In fact, all the safety stuff is standard. Nice you know, turbo engine. Nice yeah. turbo engine, nice cruiser, mm -hmm. um, fun to drive. Yeah. Um, and $35,000, you could get it for that, and uh, I think yeah. you'll be happy. That, that, honestly, that's a great choice. I, I was originally thinking Mazda CX-5, but you can't get the Mazda CX-5 with manual. any manual transmission anymore. Right. So that's right. what, you know, Tiffany really put some difficult things on us there. Yeah. But, There's a lot of, but a I lot think of filters. I, yeah, that actually <laughs> right. sounds like, it, yeah. sounds like a, a no, pretty that's, good choice. I was going to say the same thing to yeah. support the all track. Yeah. Okay, next question. Kurt says, I have a 2015 Hyundai Sonata with low speed automatic emergency braking. At what speed does low speed AEB stop working and when does high speed AEB kick in? Uh, so first of all, um, uh, automatic emergency braking was not available on the 2015 Hyundai Sonata. So my guess is what Kurt is feeling or actually seeing is forward collision warning, which was available on the 2015 Sonata. So but it does beg a question about, you know, what's the difference between low speed automatic emergency braking and high speed? The part of the problem is the manufacturers don't, there's not a set guideline for when, 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 you know, this low speed uh, goes up to this speed, you know, well, it's, it's I mean, all it, over the place. It's, it's all over the place. And, and, you know, when we talk about low speed and high speed, honestly, that's just basically how we're talking about it because everyone has got their different nomenclature right. and terminology and what whatever this is. When we're talking about high speed, we're talking about an AEB system that's gonna operate even on the highway too. Right. You know, if you're cruising along at 65, it's gonna operate. We're trying to make a point that some of these systems, they're talking about automatic emergency braking, but it's only operating at slower speeds. It's not gonna help you. Yeah, it might, might be like 35, 40 miles it's an hour. It's different right? depending yeah. on the car. Right. So I don't think, the way to think about it is like there's two different systems and it switches a gear. It's not really the way to think about it. It's just, if you have a system that has a high speed system, you could depend on, you know, I wouldn't say dependent on it, I wouldn't even go that far, but it's like it will operate, it yes. will help you mm -hmm. even in highway situations. Right. That's really the way to think about this. Yeah, it, it, almost in a sense there's either low speed AEB or there's 
all speed AEB. I put, I put air quotes up there, which doesn't help the people uh, <laughs> well, listening. That's probably a, a better way to think about it. You know it. what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, but it's not like if you have low speed AEB, it, and sometimes you can, you can order an optional high speed AEB, but it's not like they're really two different systems. It's just it, basically it just extending the, the capability the same of system. the system. The, right. the whole gamut, yeah. So hopefully that helps uh, everyone out there trying to understand how automatic emergency braking works. And of course, we're working with uh, manufacturers and trying to get everyone to be more, um, uh, be the same on what they call all these different types of systems, like right. forward collision be consistent warning, about blind the spot warning, all those kind of yeah. yeah, yeah, we're trying to trying to help standardize that, so it's yep. better for the consumers. Well, I'm I'm happy that they asked about AEB and not, um, you know, presense, right? You know, because yeah. who knows what that is? Or, yeah, there's, yeah. There's all different kinds of names out there. Um, okay, Will says, love the podcast. Uh, that's not the only reason why we're using this question. All right, but it Moving helps. On. But it helps. Uh, simple question. How should potential buyers view cars that have an NA reliability verdict in your ratings? Are they worse than cars with a one out of five rating, or is there just not enough data to assign a score in that category? I'm looking at a 2016 Subaru WRX, and I'm trying to judge how dangerous a buy it is versus a car with a one out of five rating. Jake, you know, uh, I always like to call you old reliable because you're heavily involved in our reliable. He hates it when I call you him You never that. called me. Uh, okay, I made it <laughs> up, never, I made it up. Uh, Anyway, you're heavily involved in our reliability <laughs> ratings that we do, which is, of course, based on uh, feedback, yep. you know, surveys from CR members. Yes. So talk to us about, you know, what happens when a car doesn't, you know, when has a, doesn't have the reliability data for people to look at. Sure. So the 2016, uh, you know, WRX, um, you know, it's an NA, so there's not enough data that we have to, to have information on that specific model year. Mm -hmm. um, and so what to do in that case is I would just look at adjacent model years. So um, if you look at the 2015 WRX, the reliability was much worse than average. Right, so first year. we don't have data on the 16, but you know what, considering the 15 was so bad, again, I wouldn't call it dangerous. I wouldn't right. say there's a danger, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you're gonna have likely yeah. you're going to have more than your share of more share of problems of another 2016 model. However, you know, if you really want that car and you're willing to, you know, put up with, you know, maybe more than the average share of problems, you might be very happy with that. Um, the other thing I would do is also look at that adjacent year and look at what kind of problems they're having. You know, you could actually look and, you know, and especially if you're using, you know, buying a used car, you know, if there's transmission issues, for instance, you might want to find out, well, has there, is there any issues with this transmission? Has it been replaced? Have mm -hmm. they already addressed some of the problems that may happen? Right. right. And the other thing is that when you're thinking about it, if, it, if it's a car with, you know, a much below average rating or one out of five, if you think about it in terms of the numbers, there's kind of, there's proof that that car has some issues. Mm -hmm. You know what the truth is, is that even though those cars say there is data and it's below average reliability, doesn't mean the car that you buy is gonna fall apart. It's all about odds. Right. So I mean, yeah. if you really want, if that's really something important to you, you wanna get something with a proven re record. Right. Uh, let's move on to Steve P. Uh, Steve says, I'm considering buying either a Ford F-150 or a second generation Honda Ridgeline. Looking at the trim levels and equipment I'd want on either model, there's a $6,000 to $10,000 difference between a used truck and a new one. Buying new often brings a lower interest rate and a full warranty. At what point is a new truck a better buy versus one that's two to five years older with lower mileage? Uh, I, Ryan, I'm gonna throw this to you mm -hmm. because uh, I don't, that's a lot of numbers there. And um, <laughs> what, what's you said your, I'm good at numbers. What's your suggestion? <laughs> Um, so, I said Jake was the smartest. I didn't say you weren't good with numbers. Oh, right. So uh, what's, your, what's, your, what's your recommendation for Steve P here? Um, so l listen, a brand new vehicle, um, you know, a brand new F-150 is going to be more expensive than a used F-150. Right. Okay. And that's going to be the case for most cars. Big surprise. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it's almost always going to be that way. Um, now, he, you know, he mentions the, um, well, he, and he, he put that in there and, anyway. And, and he even, said it's a six to $10,000 difference. And so. even when you consider all the other things and financing it or whatever, right. I mean, it, it's, you're going to wind up spending more, spending more. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you get the new thing, you have to want to, exactly. to spend the money for those things you're going to get. So now there is certified pre-owned vehicles um, that you would get from, you know, those actual dealers and they, they can have um, very low interest rates and warranties on them. So. There's, an, there's maybe a route there. The trouble with this question is it depends where you are, um, the deals that are to be had around you. Um, it's, you, you gotta weigh that out. If it's, 
you really want a new truck, I mean, yeah, you, you have that peace of mind. Yeah, it's brand new. I'm, I'm going to say this, this is actually an easy one. Because, yes, if you're looking at a new F-150, the used one's going to be cheaper. You're looking at the, reg, the new Ridgeline, the mm -hmm. used one. But if you're considering both a Ridgeline and an F-150, the Ridgeline is considerably less expensive. Right. And yeah, it's a two really animals, nice vehicle. Yeah. So if you're considering a used F-150, you could get a new Ridgeline for the same price, mm -hmm. and it has, I mean, I think that's the choice. Problem I, solved. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on. Christopher S. says, I own a 2010 Lexus ES 350 with just under 100,000 miles. I want a used ES 300H, but most uh, for 17 to $18,000 have 85 to 100,000 miles. I know nothing about hybrids, but see a lot uh, but see a lot make it past 100,000 miles without any issues. Would you recommend buying a used ES300H with 100,000 miles as long as all the maintenance info is present? Jake, I'm going to throw it to you. Go for it. We know a lot about hybrids, and we know a lot about, a lot about reliability. And we know and, a lot about Toyota. And hybrids. we know a lot about mm -hmm. Toyota. So all those together, I mean, the truth is, is that, look, if it was another manufacturer or it was another hybrid system, I wouldn't be given the same answer. Right. But the truth is that, high, I mean, Toyota's been, you know, about 20 years now in, and their hybrid system and the history has been just stellar. Been I mean, we've yeah. got we've got reliability going back, uh, you know, 20 years on these, mm -hmm. and it's been fantastic. And yeah. and it's not 100,000 miles. I mean, you you yeah. you go and you look at listings. You know, I mean, you, you see these 250,000 mile Priuses that mm -hmm. are like excellent condition, perfect right. condition. I mean, we've we we've tested yeah. some, and yeah. they're like, yeah, it still continues to work. So right. I would not. Um, have any issues with getting a, no. a, a, a Toyota hybrid with that kind of miles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. go for it. Um, WH says, the past two winters, I found myself unable to get to my house in the snow. I'd like to purchase my first all wheel drive vehicle in hopes that it can get me up the hill in my neighborhood and home this winter. <clears throat> my budget is 25,000 and I'm looking at a 2018 Subaru Forester, 20, 2017 Toyota RAV4 hybrid or a 2018 Mazda CX-5. Taking reliability, fuel economy, and all-wheel drive systems into consideration, which would you recommend as my next car? P.S. I'm familiar with the argument for snow tires, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm unable to store an extra set of tires. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to throw it to you first. Um, mm -hmm. What's your suggestion here? Um, really, these are three great choices. It comes down to his biggest priority. I mean, the best in the snow is probably going to be the Forester. We, we've actually done some evaluations it's of all-wheel drive, drive system. system yeah. um, we, we've done some evaluation. We also yeah. have done some surveys uh, yeah. where we've asked people and what their experiences are in different right. types of vehicles and um, Subarus. You know, it's yeah. a little bit different the way they, they, they do the mechanics of their all-wheel drive system, exactly. and, it, yeah. and it appears to, to, to work pretty well. Yeah, it does. Um, obviously, the RAV4 hybrid is going to be the best on fuel. Sure. Um, it's, it's, and that's a great car. But um, might have, uh, the, the tires might be, uh, you know. Well, the, the, tires the tires on any of these. I mean, like low rolling. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll get to that after. Yeah, but okay. the, the RAV4 hybrid, um, like I said, it's going to be the best. In the that's going to be the, that's the benefit there, the fuel economy. Yeah. And then the CX-5 is just a fun car to drive right. all sure. around. Um, right. Yeah. And the all-wheel drive system is good in that. Um, it's the most any, sporty to drive. Yeah, it's a sportier sure. car. Any of these with proper tires on it should be good in, right. in, the, but good in the snow. Right. I mean, any of them. The issue is is what the tires are on it. Exactly. And sometimes, so, so with with Toyota hybrids, mm -hmm. sometimes we'll put on tires to get that sure. extra inch of fuel low, economy. Yep. Low rolling and, yeah. you know, in our experience, I mean, I know I was driving the, our last Highlander hybrid in the snow, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not about the four-wheel drive system to get you up the hill. I mean, the four-wheel drive system is going to get you up right. yeah. the, the hill. That's, that's going to be fine. The issue is, you know, just, you know, you're cruising along on some sloppy roads mm -hmm. and, um, you know, when you go for the hybrids, sometimes those tires. Now, if it's a used car and you replace the tires, now well, you've right. even you're not stuck fields. with those tires. Right. I mean, you can you're change not. the tires. You can go to that's check a, out that's our ratings. That's a game changer. Yeah. And find tires that maybe are get some car. all weather tires. Well, maybe. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> that's a, that's an option. Now, and he, he said he doesn't have room to you know swap out uh, dedicated winter tires. That's a perfect spot for um, all weather perfect, tires. for all weather. And also, yeah. can't stress enough how important uh, tires are, especially in snow conditions. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, this person says that they're unable to store an extra set of tires, but uh, some tire places, some tire you know changing places, retailers, well, will store your your yeah. extra set of uh, tires for you. I, I, I used to do this when right. I, when, so, I, when I lived in, in Detroit. I lived in an apartment, mm -hmm. and I had my Toyota Mar2, which is a really great winter car. Fantastic. <laughs> um, and you know, I bought a set of snow tires, and and. With the package I had, they stored them and they yep. swapped them over on my wheels. Right. And yeah. so it's and worth looking into that. If you yeah. haven't looked into that yet, at least go see if your local store will do that for you. Right. You know, 
that nothing you don't beats have. You don't have a snow tire it. in the snow. Yes, absolutely. A uh, great peace of mind. Mm -hmm. um, Isaac says, I was driving my parents' 2012 Toyota Camry and had to floor it off of a turn because of quickly oncoming traffic. I saw a massive puff of white smoke behind me that I assume came from the exhaust. Can you give me an explanation as to why this happened? Uh, thanks, love the show. So the first uh, question is, was the, was the car cold when this happened? Because if it was cold, it could have just been like excess moisture coming out of the exhaust mm -hmm. pipe. Now, if it wasn't cold and it was, uh, it was this white smoke, you're looking at potentially a blown head gasket. Um, because what that, that's uh, antifreeze is, is you know, going into the exhaust and that's why you're getting this white smoke. Mm -hmm. Now, if it, if it was actually blue smoke and not white, um, now you're looking at that it's burning oil. And so now you're looking at, it could be you know, bad valve seals or piston rings. Mm -hmm. The bummer is if you know, the engine was warm uh, and you got this big puff of either white or blue smoke, it's probably going to be expensive. That's, that's, the, bu that's the bummer. <laughs> There's something it's wrong a, with, yeah, with the engine and you're going to need to look into that mm -hmm. and get that fixed. And it's, it's probably not going to be cheap. So right. sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Hopefully it was, the engine was cold when you uh, floored it. <laughs> Uh, and of course, don't floor it when the engine's cold, is another so, pro tip. Okay, um, <laughs> true. Okay, next question. Why do rear wheel drive vehicles handle better than front wheel drive vehicles? And what is the best rear wheel drive or rear wheel biased SUV under $50,000? Thank you. Uh, folks, you're lucky because we have uh, two great drivers here. Jake is a former uh, racing driver. And Ryan does a ton of dynamic testing for us, uh, both uh, with the new cars and with the tire program. So, Jake, I'm going to throw it to you first. Uh, tell, explain to people what the inherent advantages are of a rear-wheel drive car. I mean, this is just physics. So, so look, the front wheels turn, right? Um, and if you ask the front wheels to actually accelerate too, you're mm -hmm. asking them to do two different things. I mean, it's, it's really, it really comes down to tires, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. but, but it, so by dedicating the front wheels just to have to turn and not to accelerate, mm -hmm. um, and you require, require the rear ones to do that, you're asking less of the front wheels. So it, what it ultimately means is more grip. Right. Um, when you look at actually front wheel drive cars, I mean, basically everything's going on in the front wheel tires. You're asking these front tires to do basically everything. Right. And in some cases, if you look at, you know, front wheel drive cars racing, you, sometimes they're lifting up a rear they're wheel because up, they're yeah. basically not doing they're, anything. They're 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 it looks pretty fun, actually. <laughs> it, 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 it does. So, right. so, I mean, that's just, it's, it's about that. It's also about balance. Mm. The rear wheel drive vehicles generally are more balanced. They're like not closer to a 50, 50 weight. More to a 50, 50. Yeah. So like front drive cars, like all the weights up front. So right. what that gets into is also braking. Mm -hmm. So when you're hitting the brakes, you know, again, you're asking the front wheels and the front brakes to do everything, whereas you have better balance. I mean, you look at Porsche 911s, this is why they brake so well, because they have a lot of weight in the back, right. and now you're distributing the forces. Right. Right. There's also there's weight transfer. So, the, you know, the rear wheel drive car with the front engine, as it, when you accelerate, right. the, the weight, weight goes rearward. You kind of go rearward onto the, load up the wheels that you want that traction on to go forward. When you're doing, when you're, and you're braking, you're, you're stepping on the brakes, you're, you know, you're loading up the front. If you, but, like Jake said, you, if you're asking those front wheels to do too much, you're just you're going to overwhelm them. And right. um, the, unfortunately, I think rear wheel drive is slowly going away because if pe people want all wheel drive mm -hmm. and front wheel drive is um, it's, it's cheaper to build. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of all wheel drive vehicles yeah. and, you know, they do have a lot of its advantage. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're distributing out the forces there. They have the balance. So, I mean, there's plenty of choices out there. I mean, you look at all the, the luxury cars are pretty yeah. much all quite balanced and, yeah, right. and all wheel drive. And, and of course, rear wheel drive is typically more fun to drive as well because you can do more playing, you know, playing with your power on, you know, tail mm -hmm. out action. It's, it's a lot well, just, harder to get the, if you're going the front around, wheel drive to do the things it, that you want And if you're going around do. a corner and you hit the gas in the front wheel drive, so you just kind of plow forward. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's right. But the last part of this question was, what is the best rear wheel drive or, re or rear wheel biased SUV under $50,000? So uh, I came up with, um, that's actually a really difficult uh, yeah. vehicle to find as well, kind of like that previous uh, unicorn. I came up with Porsche Macan. Now it starts at 49.9, so oh, it's, no. nah, I that mean, you're really, that, that's without paint. really not going to find one. <laughs> it doesn't come with seats. But you can find a year or two old one yeah, for that price. Yeah, but that's price. the first it's, car that comes to mind. That it's car so handles, fun to drive. Yeah, it almost feels like it's rear wheel drive at times. Um, yeah. But it's obviously you're not going to, if you find one for that kind of price, I mean, you you're smirking at us. You don't like that answer, do you? I it's, love that car. It's, 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 it's imaginary. Okay. <laughs> the imaginary 50,000 Macan. Right. I mean, you could get, I mean, look, honestly, you could get like a BMW X, X3. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's a very nice yeah. handling vehicle. Yeah. Yep. You yep. can get that at $50,000. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I like to dream. 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, Alex F says, uh, why is it that when you buy a pickup truck with 4x4, four four, uh, the towing ability usually decreases? I'm assuming because of added weight, but if you buy an SUV like the Honda Pilot or Chevy Traverse, you get more towing ability with the all-wheel drive version, uh, 5,000 pounds, over the front drive version, 3,500 pounds. Isn't the all-wheel drive system uh, adding weight to the vehicle? Looking forward to your answer, and congrats on the 200th episode. Thanks, Alex. A lot of love today. Uh, so, Ryan, let's go. You tow a lot, so talk to us about um, the differences. How, why do the towing capacities differ? So, yeah, so he's actually right. It's kind of weird. The four, you know, a 4x4 four four truck tows a little less sometimes than the rear wheel drive, just the, you know, the rear uh, drive version. Yep. That comes down to weight, like you said. Um, you know, the vehicle, if you take a couple hundred pounds of axle weight and gizmos out of the front end, you have more uh, potential ability to tow because there's less weight there. Um, it's never about power. The engines nowadays can tow uh, way more than probably they're even rated for. But you have to handle the weight right. and you have to stop it. Right. So you know, a, a pickup truck is designed to tow. So um, you take out weight, you can you can probably tow more. Right. The SUV thing is interesting because it's kind of con uh, contradictory to what I just said. Right. The all-wheel drive does have more weight, but you're towing less. You don't. You load up a, a front-wheel drive SUV with this, you know, a ton of weight. You're picking at, you're actually picking up off the right. drive axles. Exactly. And so lo, like kind of like what we just talked about with the difference between front wheel drive and all wheel drive. In front, a sense, yeah. Front wheel mm -hmm. drive SUVs, you're asking them to do a ton of stuff. Right. Now that front wheel drive SUV with the same motor as maybe that all wheel drive one, yeah, it could tow the same amount of weight, but it's handling it. It's, right. it's a it's a balanced thing. Right. Um, I mean, that's yeah. a, the best yep. answer I can give you. Okay. Uh, okay, next question. Dave C says, hi, Talking Cars, love your show. I have a question about motor oil. In the recommended scheduled maintenance for all internal combustion vehicles, oil changes are recommended at a certain amount of miles or one year, whichever comes first. If I only put 1,500 miles a year on my vehicle, why should I change it at that point? If oil can deteriorate while not being used, then why don't cans of oil come with a use-by date? So. Uh, the short answer is, uh, yeah, you want to change your oil every year, regardless of how little you drive. I mean, obviously, if you drive it a lot more than that, then, then you're going to change it more than once a year. Uh, and it's not that the oil goes bad, uh, per se. It's, it's that, you know, for instance, if you, uh, you can get condensation that builds up in the engine, mm -hmm. and now that uh, makes the oil go bad. Or another thing is, so you, you don't put many miles on your vehicle, but when you do drive it, you do a lot of short trips or, you know, what we call a cold start situations, which is also not good, uh, right. not good for the engine, not good for the oil. And you end up, you know, because you don't get the engine to its peak operating temperature. You don't get rid of all the moisture. Exactly. Yeah. So now you're, you're getting contamination in that oil. So uh, unfortunately, yeah, once a year, uh, you, you want to change oil once a year, pretty much no matter what. It's, so. a, good, it's a good question. It is a, it's I a mean, great I, question. I, you know, in terms of the, you know, on the shelf, it's... Well, because it's sealed. Yeah. Right. So I mean, that's kind of the, the short answer. So right. if you open up the oil and just let it sit there, and you know, uh, maybe it would need a <laughs> an exactly. exploration. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Henry W says, uh, "How does wheel size affect ride and handling?" I think that an 18-inch tire would have a taller aspect ratio and ride more comfortably than a 19-inch tire. When I bought my 2015 Lexus RX Hybrid, the 18-inch wheels cost $700 less than the 19-inch wheels, mm -hmm. and I expected that 18-inch replacement tires would be less expensive than the 19s. True or not true? Any suggestions on which tires I should buy to replace the Bridgestone run flats that came on my car? Longtime CR subscriber, and I love the show. Ryan, you're our uh, tire guy. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Uh, <laughs> the, so he's right. I mean, um, an 18-inch, so on that car, the 18-inch wheel package will have um, a certain amount of sidewall. When you go to the 19-inch wheel, you want to keep that overall tire diameter the same, so you end up with less sidewall, lower aspect ratio. Right. Um, in general, for this, in general terms, for the same tire in those two different sizes, yeah, the less sidewall, the stiffer it's going to ride. Right. Handling-wise, it could get a little better. It's a little stiffer. It's going to give you a little, maybe a little more steering feel, um, or a little, a little sharper steering. Um, However, we have seen, and it can happen when we do our tire testing, for instance, we test the same size tire on the same car, and two different tires can ride a lot differently. Uh, one could be more, you know, more comfortable than another. We've actually seen in cases um, t testing cars where we've rented vehicles that had a different wheel package, and it happened to have a, you know, a lower aspect ratio, but a different brand or model tire, right. and it rode better than, say, the one that had more sidewall. Um, because they can tire, fiddle with the compounds, can, yes, right? There's a lot of that the, goes tires. A, uh, tires are extremely complicated, and there's a lot that goes into it. And you, they can tune a tire differently depending on, you know, even you know, from brand to brand, model to model, it can be different. Um, so what he's, you know, what he's getting at is the 
it's cheaper. Usually, and that's another thing. Generally, it's cheaper to have a um, a smaller wheel right, size. Right. It sounds silly because it almost looks like you're getting more rubber and it costs less. Where you have these skinny sidewalls and they're right. a little wider, they cost more. That's right. generally the, the the trend there. So, you know, a big thing is to make sure when you're buying a vehicle to see what this thing comes with for tires. You can buy a Honda Accord and spend two hundred dollars a piece on a tire if it has this nineteen or twenty inch wheel package on it. So, so the other thing to consider though is potholes. Mm. So, oh, and also. and when you get those low profile, really like not much rubber on the nineteens. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're trying really hard to get that ride, and they put that soft sidewall. Yeah. It means when you hit a pothole, right. you're buying a new wheel. Yep. Right. So you're going to be better off with a smaller wheel yeah. for another reason. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Gerald T says, Hi, Talking Cars. On a recent ski trip with a family, I downshifted my car to use the engine brake to slow down on long downhills to prevent riding and overheating the brakes. Do high RPMs during engine braking damage the engine uh, and transmission and waste a lot of fuel? In a hybrid plug-in uh, plug hybrid electric vehicle, should I use engine brake or regen brake for long downhills? And would I still need to worry about the brakes overheating with their regenerative braking? Jake, uh, I'm going to throw this to you. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but uh, mm -hmm. talk to us about uh, you know engine braking and, and that kind of stuff. Downshift, downshift, yeah. downshift. Um, you're not using fuel when you're using the engine to slow you down. Uh, you're not damaging anything, and you are saving your brakes. Um, if you have a hybrid vehicle or electric vehicle and you use regen braking, it, it, it's not really regen braking. You're not actually using any brakes. You're right. just using a generator to generate back the electricity. Use that first. So, so it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the brakes at all either? It's not going to hurt the brakes. It's not going to hurt the system either because it's going to be smart enough. If it does get warm or whatever, the car is going to be smart enough to to bypass it and, and not use it too much. Yeah. So, right. so absolutely and, do it. And some of these cars these days, you have like multiple levels of the, the you know, regen. And sure. so you can, you can have like one, two or three yep. uh, levels and you can, you can adjust that while you're going down the hill if you need yep. more or if mm -hmm. you need less. So it's kind of neat actually. Um, yeah, and that's the other thing about manual transmissions is that that was you know, one of the things I love about manual transmissions <coughs> is that you can, you know, you downshift to uh, when you're going down a hill. Um, so. Yep, and, and you can on automatic. Exactly. I mean, sometimes exactly. it's a paddle shift yep. and all those right. things. Most yep. people don't use them, but yeah. you can. Yep. Okay. Uh, Terry J says, I'm only five feet tall. I've been shopping for a new car and really love the 2019 Volvo XC40. My problem is that the headrest tilts forward, pushing my head and neck into a very uncomfortable position. I've had the same problem when I sit in other cars too, so I'm not even taking them off the lot. Uh, is there a headrest solution for shorter people? I understand there are safety issues, but luxury cars can be designed for tall people. Thanks. Uh, this one I have some familiarity with because even I don't have a headrest issue when I'm driving. And of course, I'm almost never in the passenger seat. But when I take my sister somewhere, uh, one of the first things she does when she gets in, a, in one of the test cars is she's like, annoyed with the headrest she goes yeah. Mick why is it dude why is it tilted forwards how do I get it and you know some of these you can adjust yep. you know you push them forwards and they go back right. or you can adjust the height uh, but she does get really annoyed with that and she mm -hmm. same thing she's only five feet tall so it, it is an issue um, what you know what's going on with that well, that's, I mean, that's a safety thing right well um, first of all it's, it's not a it's not a headrest it's a, it's a head restraint. It's, it's designed for crash is right. really what it's for. It's not to be comfortable to put your head back. Right. Um, that's one thing. But it's absolutely true that so some vehicles don't fit shorter drivers or taller drivers um, very well. And that's why when we test the, all our vehicles, we put in a five foot tester and we put in a taller tester Me. to figure out. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the so, oh, um, not the, you're not the five foot guy. No, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's like that is really important. So um, yes, absolutely. You know, you're buying a car, check that first. Um, and some, some do a much better job than others. I will say one tip though, um, sometimes when you get in a situation and you might even be a passenger of someone else's car and you do have that situation where that head restraint is just smacking there right in there. Sometimes you can avoid it by how you set the seat back. Mm. So if you have a very upright position mm. and maybe right in your head, you might want to recline it a little bit, move the seat bottom a little bit closer and you might remedy some of that situation. So try different seating positions, but right. certainly try those positions before you buy a car. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, we got through a fair amount of questions. Hopefully uh, we gave you some good answers. Uh, if you want to learn more about the cars we talked about, you can click on the links in the show notes. And don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30 second video submissions to talkingcars at iCloud.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you all next week.